Getting ready to go live. Amen. And we're live. And we're live. Welcome on Facebook. Uh, for those who of you have tuned in, uh, we just want to say hi to you. I know uh, we want to apologize uh, for Facebook's failure to keep our video up last week. Uh, we don't know what happened, but uh, you can go uh, back on my wall on Facebook and you can watch last week uh, the entire message. Uh, we pieced it together. We did manage to have it saved on a video card and uh, we saved it and it's posted on the wall uh, and you can find it there. This morning, uh, we're going to be talking about judgment in the whole world. The whole world can, will be under judgment. And we want to address the fact that Christians need to learn how to bring witness into people in this world. I was listening to uh, a well-known minister uh, talking and he was talking about in World War II there was a Japanese commander of some kind of sorts I, I'm not sure I can't remember what he was in command of other than a prison camp and this commander was very serious uh, against the, the American military and he was seemed to be making it his goal that foreign prisoners did not survive his military camp. He even went so far as to starve his prisoners for days and then he fed them rice that had not been shelled out of the hulls. And the hulls, the, the prisoners were so hungry that they ate the rice, hulls and all, not realizing that the hulls were loaded with, they were like razor blades in their stomach, and the hulls would just literally shred, shred their stomach apart and kill them. And this, this uh, commander was later found to be uh, working in a golf course, uh, a very lowly job. The, the courts had been searching for him for years trying to bring this man to justice for the war crimes that he had committed against the, the, the prisoners that he had been in charge of. And he was brought and arrested. He was tried and he was convicted to hang. And a question was put before him when he was getting ready to hang and I, he answered the question by saying this I have put my trust in Jesus Christ I have no other hope than in Jesus Christ and I welcome the the opportunity to soon meet Jesus Christ who saved me from my sin and the, they asked him why what caused you to make this turnaround what caused you to turn your life over to Jesus Christ and he said it was the prisoners in the prison camp the ones who professed Jesus Christ had such a witness that it tore me apart. It haunted me and it, it would not leave me until I turned to Jesus. Amen. In a world today <clears throat> that is so filled with all kinds of error, with all kinds of alternative thinking. The, the thinking that says, if I think I'm a door, I'm a door. If I think I'm a, a horse, I must be a horse. 
this alternative thinking. <laughs> For those of us who love the Bible, it just drives us insane to feel like there are people who think that, listen to this, what is postmodernism? We're, we're going to keep trying to approach this until we find a way to work in an effective way. <clears throat> Postmodernism holds that one's philosophy of life is ultimately determined by the community or group which most influences one's life. <clears throat> now we see that in action in national politics today. There is a, a party that is has turned in a nasty direction. And those who are associated with that political party, uh, a lot, they have a, a lot of followers who have even gotten worse than the leaders. And the leader, leaders are bad enough. Other factors such as personal choice or religion are secondary. Postmodernism is to a great extent an attack upon what postmodernists call meta, meta narratives, which postmodernism is to a great extent an attack upon, excuse me, I, I got the wrong line, which are grand stories about the world. Okay, the postmodernists are attacking the narratives of creation, the narratives of how our country came to be, the narrative that says our country is a, a nation that was founded on the Bible and godly principles. They have now <coughs> changed that narrative to suit their self. They even go as far as to say is that the United States is not a Christian country anymore. Postmodernists have these truths and that are actually myths, they're fictional stories that embody the central core of a culture's values and beliefs and are, are in the sense of fundamentally religious. I know that sounds like googly gark talk there. In medieval times, the meta-narrative, meta excuse me, meta-narrative, was one of submission to ecclesiastical or divine authority. In modern times, the meta narrative was one that promoted the power of individual minds guided by methods of observation to attain truths needed for guiding one's own life. <coughs> John Dewey's modern man, for example, was self assured in control of his own destiny, <coughs> needing no authority outside of himself. Uh, I was that was one of the big things that I was taught in uh, at U of L was that men need to be self-actuating. We need to be in con control of ourselves and not be controlled by any external force. Postmodernism, on the other hand, has moved from this autonomy to anxiety. The false gods of modernity, self-actualization, false gods of modernity can no longer be used to save us, okay? They've gone no step. It's not self-actualization anymore. Meta-narratives now need to be deconstructed, in other words, exposed for what they really are, myths that gave authority to those who wrote the stories, the Bible. It's a myth. When I was in world history, the professor talked about the flood myth, Noah's flood myth, a myth like in mythological characters or a mythological story. Meta narratives are deconstructed, they're exposed, they say that they're, they're not true, and it goes on. And it goes on. And we need to continually work on that. 
it seems as though maybe one of the most effective weapons we have is our testimony. Are we consistent? Are we who we say we are? If I say that it's a sin to drink and you catch me down to Longhorn Steakhouse and I've got a margarita sitting in front of me, what does that say about my word and my testimony? Is it the same? Am I saying touch your nose and I'm touching up here? So it seems as though our personal testimony, our influence for the cause of Jesus Christ is being watched. We know that. There's always somebody watching us. And we need to expose Jesus Christ to those who think that he's a myth. There are those of us who have been saved not too many years past. And for those who have been saved in a short amount of time, you have had a chance to live your life in an ungodly fashion. And when you come to Jesus Christ, you now have a different king. He may not be your king at first, but he's still the king. And we have people who get saved. They struggle. They sin. <clears throat> they feel conviction. They struggle. They sin. They feel conviction. And until one day, they choose to make Jesus Christ the king of their life. They have come to make Jesus Christ their Lord. There are those who say that in order to get saved, you must make Jesus Christ your Lord immediately. How can a person who's been living an ungodly lifestyle choose instantly to submit to Jesus Christ as Lord of their life? We come to Jesus Christ for salvation. We, have, we do get saved. And then there comes a time when we can't live with just being saved. We have to come to make Jesus Christ our Lord. That's when people get the power to turn away from sin. That's when the power of the Holy Spirit begins to move and work in your life to where you can influence others. <coughs> That's right. This morning we're going to look at Isaiah 24. Let's read the first six verses. Behold, the Lord lays the earth waste, devastates it distorts its surface and scatters its inhabitants. And the people will be like the priest, the servant like his master, the maid like her mistress, the buyer like the seller, the lender like the borrower, and the creditor like the debtor. The earth will be completely laid waste and completely despoiled, for the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourns and it rises, or excuse me, it withers. The world fades and withers. The exalted of the, the people of the earth fade away. Verses 5 and 6. The earth is also polluted by its inhabitants, for they transgressed the laws, violated statutes, broke the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse devours the earth, and those who live in it are held guilty. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. This is God's word. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would expose your word to us this morning and help us to understand it in a more perfect and clear way. God, we we just throw ourselves on your mercy this morning to do what do for people what we can't do. Enlighten people's minds that we can't begin to enlighten. People have turned away from you. They have made themselves pray for the Antichrist. God, lead us and guide us and help us, Father, 
In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The first thing we want to look at in our message is transgressors of the law and violators of statutes. That's in verse 5. Transgression is, uh, I looked it up in the dictionary as, an, <coughs> as a noun. It's abuse, it's a breach, it's a crime, it's delinquency, it's dereliction, it's disobedience, encroachment, error, fault, it's a guilty act. As an illegal action, it's an infraction, it's an infringement, it's iniquity, it's misbehavior, and it's a misdeed, it's misdoing, mis malfeasance. Not observance, offense, it's sin. There are three aspects of the law. In today's world, the, the godless society love to take the word of God and point out in the Old Testament that uh, if you are too chilly, you can turn that thermostat up. The, the godless crowd of, in, of the world love to point out laws in the Old Testament that we don't use today. They do not understand that there are three types of the law in the Old Testament. First of all, there is the moral law. We don't throw the moral law out. The moral law says thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not tell a lie. Thou shalt not kill or murder. Thou shalt not covet what your neighbor has. The Bible has the moral law laid out for us. We don't throw the moral law out. Then there is the civil law. In the Old Testament, there was civil law to show the people how to live within society. <coughs> Part of that civil law is thou shalt not murder. It shows up again. And, and I think you can understand why civil law would say thou shalt not murder because murder is chaos. And we need to not invite ourselves into chaos. So thou shalt not murder is a part of civil law. Then there is ceremonial law. There are laws in the Old Testament that says that we do a certain thing in a certain ceremony. One of those ceremonies was the slaughter of lambs and to shed their blood in order that the blood would atone for the sin of the people in the Old Testament. And the godless crowd loved to point out that a guy's next door neighbor is barbecuing on Sunday. He's built a fire on Sunday. He's broken the law. <coughs> and they love to point out that those are laws we don't keep anymore. Our laws that the Bible commands us to obey that people just don't bother with. Because that would be ridiculous in today's society. Well, the law is there to teach us the way of transgressors is hard. Proverbs 13 says, Proverbs 13, 5 says, A righteous man hates falsehood, but a wicked man acts disgustingly and shamefully. A righteous man hates falsehood, a lie. We get that, right? <clears throat> the world today doesn't get that. The world today says, if, if I need to lie in order to, to promote my own cause, it's okay. After all, the law is whatever I want it to be. That's the postmodernist way of thinking. That thinking is flawed. And I hope that there is someone who was watching who is a postmodernist. And keep watching. 
because we want to beg and plead with you that you change your way of thinking because <laughs> Satan is setting you up to be prey for the Antichrist. That too is something you may not believe in. But Satan is setting you up and a strong delusion will come on you and you will be, you will fall victim to all of these lies. And those of us who have been born again understand that falsehood will get us in trouble. And we hope today to show you that this falsehood that you have fallen for is going to put you in a terrible condition that will ultimately put you in hell. And hell is real. Whether you want to believe it and accept it or not, we want to say with love, hell is real. Hell is hot. And hell is a horrible place. Please don't fall victim to that because you have chosen to buy into a falsehood. Proverbs 13.10 says, Through insolence comes nothing but strife, but wisdom is with those who receive counsel. We see today young people on college campuses who are insolent. They have a speaker to come in who has moral values, who has a foundation on a solid rock, and they have a riot. That's insolence. Proverbs 13, 11 says, the wealth obtained by fraud dwindles, but the one who gathers by labor increases it. We live in a society today who feels like there is no problem with their business deals as long as it favors them and they will do any shortcut to make money. <clears throat> that will not work with God. Proverbs 13.13 13 says, The one who despises the word will be in debt to it, but the one who fears the commandment will be rewarded. This is particularly for those of you who are not believing the word. Because you are in debt to the word simply by your unbelief. Please allow yourself to think critically. Though you haven't been trained for it. Take a moment and logically reason this out. If you hate the word, if you don't believe the word, if you ignore the word, if you just think that you are able to just say, I don't believe the word, and that means the word is not true, please understand that will not work in front of the in front of God. There are liars there are thieves, and there are false gods. We have people who lie for a living. We have people who are willing to steal from their own parents. They will steal from their own grandparents. I heard a man say that he was somewhere and he heard this these coins rattling together. And he knew instantly by the sound of these coins that he was hearing rattle together that he was hearing real, honest to goodness, real silver coins rattling together. And this has been within the last little bit. Real silver coins are not generally in circulation today. These people had a whole bag full of them. And this person was able to negotiate with uh, these people and uh, he struck a deal with them. Now I don't know if they purchased these coins from somebody 
who had stolen them. I don't know if he had, they had purchased or they gotten these coins themselves by stealing them or from somebody else who had just didn't know what they had. Just needed money. Maybe they found somebody that just needed money. But anyway, the coins were purchased. But people are willing to be thieves in this society. And we have to be on the lookout for that. We have to be careful. And there are false gods. In today's society, whatever we want to be our God, we can make it our God. In India, uh, I've heard Rabbi Zacharias talk about the number of gods in India, and I, I don't even know if anybody knows how many they've got over there. There's in the hundreds of thousands. <coughs> I've heard 12,000. I've heard 1,000. I've heard hundreds of thousands. In other words, and, and I think that's true in America. I think it's true in America today that people make their job their God. I think it's true in America that people make something their God. And I think it's true in America that people make someone their God. And I think it's true in America that people make some idea their God. When there is only one true God, and I beg you to plead with you to look at the stars in the sky and see if you see any patterns in the sky. Uh, I know that there's a pattern called the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper, and I know that as a child I used to go out to get the cows up to milk, and I would always see early in the morning, I could see the, the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper, and the Big Dipper was all at the end of the pan was always pointing to the North Star, and the North Star was the first star in the handle of the Little Dipper. And I know that different days you would go out and the Big Dipper would be holding water. It would be turned in such a, it's like a pan, and it's be turned in such a way, if it had water in it, the water would stay in it. <clears throat> And then there's times you could go out and the pan would be turned upside down. And that's simply because the earth rotates and it changes the pattern of the way the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper look. And I know if you go out and you look at nature and you see the trees and if you get into microbiology and you tear the cells apart and you begin to look at the cells and understand that there is such a pattern to the way the body is made that who made the pattern? We have to choose to ignore that somebody has the, the plans. There was a, not only a, a creator, but that creator is our Lord God, our Jehovah, our Jesus Christ, our Holy Spirit, the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I believe in all three, and I believe they're all one. Sin is lawlessness. 1 John 3, 4 says, Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Suppression of the truth is wickedness. <coughs> if you know the truth and you will not reveal the truth, when the truth is important, suppression of the truth is wickedness. We have people everywhere who do that. Well, I'm just going to sit here and I'm not going to say a word. I'm just going to let this thing pass on by. I'm not going to get involved. And you allow the truth to be suppressed. That's wickedness. Psalm 37, 21 says, The wicked borrows and does not pay back, but the righteous is gracious and gives. There are people who make loans and they look for every way in the world to keep from paying them back. And then there are righteous people who just freely give. Jeremiah 6, 19, Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, 
because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our, unright or all our righteousness are as filthy rags. We do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Here's the truth. We all sin. We've all told lies. I have told lies. Did anybody ever teach me to tell a lie? No. I grew up knowing how to tell a lie. Have I ever stolen anything? Yes, I have stolen things. And have I asked you by Facebook, have you lied? Have you ever told a lie? Have you ever stolen? And you see, Isaiah says, uh, very good there, but we're all as unclean thing, and all of our righteousness is filthy rags. The very best that we could perform is like filthy rags. Now, for a mechanic, a filthy rag would mean that, that you picked up an old greasy rag full of iron shavings and dirt, and you would begin to wipe your cylinder walls out and prepare your motor to be put back together. Now, any good mechanic knows that you don't use that kind of a cloth to wipe a cylinder wall to prepare it to get for reassembly. For those who cook, a filthy rag would be something that dropped on the floor. You know, we laugh and say, well, it didn't make the five-second rule yet. We pick it up and we go on. For those who are in the medical profession, we just heard this morning about two young people that had surgery under the hand of the same doctor in the same hospital, and both of them have infections from where they had surgery. And they're under treatment. Filthy rags, filthy rags, the very best of our works is as filthy rags. The very best that I can do on the best day of my life stinks in God's eyes. That's the very best. Who knows what it is like to God on the days that I did my worst. I submit that to you who are watching by Facebook. The scripture says the best we have to offer is but filthy rags in God's eyes. God demands perfection. Without perfection, there's a terrible penalty awaiting all of us who reject Jesus Christ. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. How many of you have a job? <clears throat> Amen. What happens when you have a job? You work. You get a paycheck, right? Well, sin has a paycheck. And that paycheck is eternal damnation in a place called hell. <coughs> it's a real place. It's not imaginary. It's not a figment. It's not a myth. Hell is a real place. Hell is a place where the worm will not die. Hell is a place where the fire will not go out. Hell is a place of torment. Hell is a place where you have no friends. Yeah, I hear people laugh and say, wow, I, I may go to hell, but all my friends are going to be there. Well, I submit to you that when you get to hell, you will have no friends. And if you had friends, all of you will be in such pain and agony that you would not even think about looking for your friend. We hear jokes about hell. Well, you know... People get tricked into going to hell because they get a sample and they go down there and they're playing golf the whole time. That's not the way it works. Hell is not a joke. Hell is an awful place. <clears throat> Imagine a person who spent their life as a mass murderer. 
A mass murderer is a person who kills a lot of people. That means they kill more than three people at one time. A serial killer is somebody who kills more than three people at different times. So imagine a serial killer who had killed 50 people or so, <coughs> i.e. Uh, Ted Bundy or Jeffrey Dahmer. And if you were in hell with a person like that, imagine that person who was looking for somebody to kill all the time. Ted Bundy spent a lot of money on gas in his gas receipts that he bought with a credit card. He had a Volkswagen car and he was trolling the whole area looking for some unsuspecting woman to lure into the car whom he promptly knocked out and then took them and did whatever he chose to do. Ted Bundy was a man who killed his first victim while he was still a teenager. He killed a babysitter. Ted Bundy killed a lot of people. Now suppose Ted Bundy's in hell. He'll be trolling hell looking for somebody to kill all through eternity. Suppose a person who is an adulterer who just cannot stand to stay with a, a, a covenant relationship, who is constantly looking for somebody else to commit adultery with, if that person spends all eternity looking and trolling for somebody to commit adultery with. Well, it's not going to happen in hell. There's going to be so much pain and so much misery in hell that nobody's going to have any fun in hell. You're not going to be playing golf. You're not going to be drinking martinis. You're not going to be telling jokes. But there is some things that there will be no more of in hell. There will be no more family relationships in hell. Your grandmothers who loved you and prayed for you. <coughs> your mother who begged you to come to Jesus Christ will not be begging you to come to Jesus Christ anymore. There will be no more. In hell there will be no more love. Your grandmother and your mother who begged you to come to Jesus will not be there to give you love. There will be no family gatherings in hell. There will be no Thanksgiving dinners in hell. There are, hell is a place where there will be no more of some things that you're going to miss. Hell is an awful place. I wouldn't wish hell on my worst enemy. Hell is a reality. For the wages of sin is death. But the good news, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The inhabitants of the earth broke the everlasting covenant in verse 5. God made an everlasting covenant with us. In Genesis 9, 16, he says, When the bow was in the cloud, then I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God says, I made this covenant, and when you see the rainbow in the heaven, Remember my covenant. What do people do when they see the rainbow? They don't think of God's covenant anymore. They think of how the White House was lit up in rainbow colors on a given night when the Supreme Court chose to turn away from the word of God and make some uncodly lifestyle legal. We no longer think of the covenant of the rainbow. In the right way. The rainbow means now something entirely different. I cringe now when I see people displaying the rain rainbow when I can't tell what they mean by it. <clears throat> it's like seeing two men walking down the street and, and or two women walking down the street or two women that's always together. You look on Facebook you see two women that's always together in pictures and you begin to wonder what kind of a yeah. What, what's the reason for that? 
we call into question every kind of thing anymore that was godly years ago. Well, women, Miss Vicki Morris has been teaching our women that women need women. Women need women to help them stay strong. Men need men to help them stay strong. We as the church all need each other to stay strong. In fact, Wednesday night, we're going to have a teaching here, right here at Thursday, excuse me, on Thursday night. We're going to... <laughs> My Baptist background is showing up. <laughs> church background. Went to church on Wednesday nights. Now we do Bible study on Thursday night. We're having a teaching Thursday night about how the demonic spirits have gotten into the church who call themselves a church. Don't miss it. Not only that, Bill Grewey has been sending me information about an organization called NAR. N-A-R. New Apostolic Re Reformation. Those who are in this demonic spirit movement in the church pass right on into there. People need each other. We need to learn. We need to go wide open with their eyes wide open. <clears throat> we need to learn these things. We need to know that there are demonic spirits who have entered into the church as something good. And you will see Thursday night how this something that was supposed to be so good has entered into the church and caused problems. Second Samuel 23 5 Truly is not my house so with God, for he has made an everlasting covenant with me, ordered in all things, and secured for all my salvation. And all my desire, will he not indeed make it grow? And I need everlasting covenant. And Second Samuel twenty three five, Hosea six four. <clears throat> what shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? For your loyalty is like a morning cloud, and the, like the dew which goes away early. There are people who are like that today. Their loyalty is like a morning fog. The sun comes up, the temperature comes up, and the fog goes away. And so there are people today whose loyalty is about as lasting as the, the morning fog. And there's some of you by Facebook who have had friends that you just can't believe they turned their back on you. You just can't believe that their loyalty is that little. People are breaking everlasting covenants. We have broken the covenant with God. God has never made a covenant, covenant with man that he broke. The breaking is always on our side. For it's men, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The glory of God demands perfection. I request of you, sir, ma'am, those of you who are watching by Facebook, for those of you who are sneaking around watching the video on Facebook because you don't want anybody here to know that you're watching it, I submit to you, please watch. You'll learn that your imperfections will keep you out of a place that you really need to be. You ever wondered why when people die, have you ever heard anybody posting on Facebook one of their relatives died and went to hell? I mean, nobody ever posts on Facebook, well, my, my uncle so-and-so died and I, he busted hell wide open. Nobody ever. It's funny, everybody that dies goes to heaven. It's funny that every animal crosses the Rainbow Bridge. I've seen some cows that ain't never seen a rainbow bridge. I've seen some horses I had some serious question about, and I've seen some dogs that definitely wasn't going to cross the rainbow bridge. What about the raccoons that comes and eats all your chicken? When they die, are they going to cross the rainbow bridge? People get silly ideas, amen? I hope you people on Facebook are watching this. 
I hope you understand that not all animals cross the Rainbow Bridge. You tree huggers who got out in the... I saw a video the other day of tree huggers out in the woods crying because the trees were dying. There was dead trees in the woods. They were out there acting like a bunch of idiots crying because they were, not... <coughs> they, they were out there crying because of dead trees. A curse devours the earth and those who live in it are held guilty. That's verse 6. A curse is everywhere. Genesis 3.19 said, Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth, and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. Hello? Pain in childbirth. Women like to control her husbands. But God says he'll rule over you. And to the man, oh men, you're not, you didn't escape this. <laughs> Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. You will grow thorns and it will grow thorns and thistles for you. Anybody ever chop the weeds out of your garden? You ever been walking through the cow field and a big old thistle grab you and send you in orbit? Have you ever walked beside a thorn tree? And do you like to get up close to a hawthorn bush? By the sweat of your brow you will have to eat food uh, until you return to the ground. We all return to the ground unless Jesus comes. So in our daily lives, we consent to the law of in Genesis where God said, because you sin, these things are going to happen. Women scream during childbirth. I mean, it's, they tell me it's painful. Now we've got men who are having sex changes and doctors who are fixing them up to where men can actually be pregnant and deliver a baby. I don't understand the world we live in. I don't understand that. There's nothing about that that makes sense. God's ultimate judgment will be at the great white throne. The great white throne judgment is the judgment that nobody ought to want to be at. And I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it, the earth and the sky filled, fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. Ooh. You can run, but you can't hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. You got that? You're at the great white throne judgment. You're going to be judged according to your works by a holy God, a God who is the ultimate in holiness. He is holy. Our God is a holy God. And he will be the one who gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death, and anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. <clears throat> and there's only one way to get your name in the Lamb's book of life. And that's to accept Jesus Christ and make him your Savior. That's to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. There's only one way. We had that song on. One way, <clears throat> Jesus. You're the one that's worth living for.
God's covenant. God made a covenant with Noah. But I will confirm my covenant with you, so enter the boat, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. And when they entered the boat, before the flood came, before the judgment came, what happened? <coughs> God shut the door and, and locked it. God's the one that locked that door. Not Noah. They were completely secure from the judgment that was about to happen. The worldwide flood myth. Which is not a myth. It's a true and living story. The fossil record proves that this is a living story. It's a living record. It's a living truth. The flood is not a myth. God shut them in. He made a covenant with Noah to protect him and save him. God has made a covenant with you and me to save us and protect us and to take us to heaven when we die. And if you're watching by Facebook, God has made a covenant with you whether you realize it or not. When you come to faith and believe in Jesus Christ and you make him your Savior, he puts your name in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. And he takes you to heaven when you die. God made a covenant with Israel. Excuse me. He made a covenant with Abraham. <clears throat> so the, the Lord made a covenant with Abram that day and said, I have given this land to your descendants all the way from the border of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. And for those of you who think Israel has no right in the promised land, you're wrong. This is a covenant that God made with Abram all the way from the Nile River to the Euphrates River. That ought to really blow your mind. It belongs to Israel. Fighting over the little patch that Israel already has. Saying Israel has no right to be in that land. We even have churches who have taken a stance against Israel and said Israel is now the church and it's not the real literal Israel. That's called replacement theology. I will have no part of replacement theology because that's not what God said. God made a covenant with Israel and he told them to look up their eyes from the north to south, east and the west, for all the land which thou seest, I will give it thee, and to thy seed forever. <clears throat> what part of forever is the PLO not getting? Man cannot keep the covenant God made with us. In Galatians 3, 22 through 24, but the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, they were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later revealed. Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. <coughs> If you have not come to Jesus Christ by faith, you are being held captive under the law. That means that if you tell a lie, you're held captive. That means if you commit adultery, you've held you're being held captive. That means if you look at a woman walking down the street and you imagine yourself having looking at her undercover parts, you're committing adultery. For you women who look at men and you undress men, you're committing adultery. Saying, it doesn't matter whether it's a man or a woman. We have women just as deeply involved in pornography as men are. Who think it's normal, who think it's good. Being held captive by the law, you, you're shut up by the law. The law is there, my friends, lady, gentlemen, 
man, woman, you're there and the law is there to tell you that you need Jesus. When you make fun of the law and says that if that said and as the, the liberals do, when they, use, they say, well, you, you don't want to kill your neighbor because he's barbecuing pork next to you on Sunday. <clears throat> the law says not to eat pork. The law says not to build a fire on Sunday. You're supposed to kill people. In the Old Testament, they were to kill people who did not keep covenant with God. The, word, the least punishment they could get was being banished from the nation of Israel. They would become an outcast. And that's the least of the issue that you would face. They make fun of that law. They, they say it's ridiculous, the Bible. And so they say, therefore, the whole Bible is ridiculous. We cannot do that. The good news is sin kills, but Jesus saves. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 8, 7. The first covenant, had, if it had been faultless, <clears throat> there would have been no need for the second covenant to replace it. We are now in the days of the second covenant because Jesus has died for sin. He shed his blood to cover all of our sin. He shed his blood to cover your sin even if you don't believe in him. But until you do put your trust in him, your sin is open and exposed and you are in prison. <clears throat> is the law then given against the promise of God? This is Galatians 3, 21 through 24. God forbid, for if there had been a law given that could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture has concluded all under sin that by the promise of faith that Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should soon afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. We have no hope beyond the grave without Jesus Christ. Sir, ma'am, there is no hope when you die without Jesus. You have no hope. Your life is going to be gloomy without Jesus Christ. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's Romans, <clears throat> Romans 5, 8. Acts 17, 30. In the times of ignorance, God winked at sin. But not, now God commended everywhere to men everywhere to repent. It's time for men to repent. Repentance. When you realize that you have committed sin, when you realize <clears throat> that your sin sends you to hell. When you realize that hell is an awful place. When you realize that Jesus died on the cross to save you from your sin, you change your way of thinking, and that's called repentance. You go from laughing at Jesus and laughing at the Word of God and laughing at your grandmother who has been on her knees praying for you laughing at your daddy who gets on his knees and prays for you and begs God for you, who in his bedroom gets in a chair and puts his face in the bottom of it and cries out to God for you, and you laugh at him and say he don't know what he's talking about. That's what goes on. That's what goes on in Christian homes that the world does not see. The world does not see mothers and daddies and grandmothers and grandfathers who cry out to God for their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. Begging God to save them at an early age and begging God to call them into his service and to use them in a powerful way. Begging God, pleading with God, crying real tears. 
I know men cry real tears for their families, and so do women. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life. You think you're living? You haven't even seen life yet because you haven't trusted in Jesus Christ. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. <clears throat> That's not an empty promise. That is from the word of God. I don't care how bad you are. I don't care how many times you've done wrong. I don't care if you're a murderer. I don't care if you're a drug addict. There is hope. And that hope is in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only one that can save you and get you out of going to hell for everlasting punishment. And then you get your name put in the Lamb's Book of Life and you're in heaven for all eternity instead of hell for all eternity. And for those of you who believe that when you die, it's over, it's done, the lights are out, there is no more, I'm sorry, <coughs> but you will face everlasting punishment. The worm does not die in hell. There will be everlasting punishment. You could hear, you could... If you're listening, and I've prayed for 10 of you who are watching by Facebook that you will come to Jesus Christ. Last night, David and me got in, in here in this room, and we prayed for 10 people to watch and come to Christ today. And we're begging and pleading. If you're watching this and you got to the end of it, and you got somebody in your family that's lost, Ask them and beg them to tune in and watch the whole message. Now, if you realize that you're lost and on your way to hell, you can change all of that by changing the way you think, by repenting of your evil deeds, and come to Jesus Christ and submit to Him. And submit to God. You can say a prayer like this. And there's, Dear God, I, I know I'm a sinner. I've messed up. You know where it was, you know when it was, and you know who I did it with. Dear Lord Jesus, will you save me? Will you take me to heaven when I die? Will you put my name in the Lamb's Book of Life? Will you help me to live for you while I'm here on this earth? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving me. Now, you can back the video up, and you can pray that prayer and let it be your words and not my words. Now, I'm just going to tell you right up front, if you think you're just going to mouth and lip sync with the words, it ain't going to count. If you don't mean it in your heart, it ain't going to count. And that's, I'm sorry, that's the way it says. It ain't going to count. You can, you can pretend like you're doing it, but it does not count with God. Well, if you truly repent in your heart and you truly come to Jesus Christ and you truly put all of your eggs in his basket, you put all of your faith in what his finished work was on the cross, when he died for you, he said it is finished. And when he said it is finished, that means that he paid it all. And all to him we owe. I beg you now. Ask Jesus Christ into your life. The address is on the screen. Churchministries.org You can look it up. There's contact numbers at that website. And you can call us and let us know you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. David, you can cut it off. <laughs>